When I was a child, our meals mainly consisted of root vegetables, legumes, whole grain bread, and raw kale salad. My mother often sighed and said, I didn't cook food with this much care for you to gobble it down in just 10 minutes. And because persistence pays off, I remember my childhood meals as peaceful moments, whole family sitting together, everyone ate the same thing, and you always had to finish what you put on your plate. My mother didn't have more time than I do. She worked full time to care of our home as well as me and my brother. But with the help of foresight, knowledge, common sense and creativity, she always served food that meets today's science on what's sustainable for climate and health. And the irony is that today I call those same ingredients the food of the future when I lecture about it through my work at a sustainability organization. Today, Food production and consumption are responsible for an immense part of our sustainability problems. More than a quarter of the greenhouse gas emissions are directly caused by food production. 70% of freshwater use is for food production. And agriculture is the primary driver of biodiversity loss. In addition, over 2 billion people are overweight, while hundreds of millions of people suffer from hunger. The way we produce and consume food is upside down, and therefore we have to change the food system. My name is Anna Henning Moberg, and I work as the operations manager for Torsåke Farm, just north of Stockholm, a test farm and practical center for the sustainable food systems of the future. In our test kitchens, we develop new food products, often by using waste streams like byproducts from oatmeal production or bycatch from professional fishing. And to succeed in this, we interact with researchers. We use modern technology, knowledge, and creativity. But we also try to learn from our ancestors. This is where I grew up. In a townhouse in a suburb of southern Stockholm, where whole grain bread and raw kale salad were frequent in our meals. Red meat was a luxury that was served maybe two times a month when we, always on a Friday, got one thin slice of steak with oven-baked frozen fries and bernet sauce made from powder. It was absolutely heavenly. Perhaps because it was so rare. And for me, it was at the dinner table that I learned where the food came from, how it was cooked, and that it was too valuable to waste. It was also at the dinner table that I first understood how important food is for health. Both my parents were past war children who made a class journey, and they spent all their efforts to allow me and my brother to go to the best schools, so the food budget was not large. And yet, I remember the meals from my childhood as incredibly tasty. With both my parents' families from the hill country in northern part of Sweden, I spent endless summer by the river, in the forest, and blooming meadows. And there I got to experience agriculture and forestry up close, which gave me the respect for all the work that underlies our food. It was also up north that I first understood that food can be something truly unique and fantastic, thanks to these, the Arctic raspberries, åkerbär in Swedish. Putting them in my mouth was a flavor explosion of acid sweetness and wonderful aromas that have ripened under all the sunshine hours close to the Arctic Circle. When I was 14 years old, my interest in food was so great that I begged for a part-time job in one of Stockholm's largest food markets. This was a fantastic place where we plucked birds, we scrubbed and boiled seafood and prepared all kinds of food in the basement. What the food market had in common with my mother's approach to food was that nothing was to be thrown away. Bones uh, from meat and fish, as well as peels from vegetables, became flavorful and nutritious broths that we sold or further refined into good soups and sauces. And I also learned about the benefits about seasonal foods here. That asparagus is tastiest in the springtime. And that we northerners, we are spoiled due to the sheer amount of sunshine hours there are strawberries get in the summer. We don't have to have access to all kinds of food all the time. It's nice to be able to look forward to something. 
One of the tastiest things I knew as a child was picking sugar snaps directly from the plant during summer. And today, they are available year-round in every grocery store in Sweden, flown in from Africa. In the food market, I realized I had a talent for smell and taste, which led me to study to become a sommelier. And you all know the pretentious language that is used to describe wine, right? But to really be good at wine, you need to use your own memory vault of fragrances. And mine is huge, because I've been smelling and tasting everything for as long as I can remember. For example, Chardonnay from Burgundy. It smells exactly like when my mom pulled her feet out of her high black rubber boots. <laughs> A mixture of rubber, warm skin, clay, and a touch of sweat. And I never miss that it's white burgundy, but it would be completely impossible for anyone, except maybe for my brother, to understand what I mean. And today I'm glad for all the years I spent on wine and sensory training, because I use this in developing new food products. Because as long as we don't have to, we don't want to eat food that doesn't taste well. My interest in where food and drink come from became so large that eventually I studied to become a journalist, to make a living from my hobby. And thanks to that, I've been able to interact with and written about a lot of food and wine producers from all over the world. And the ones that capture my heart are the ones who made amazing products from limited resources. Just like my mom, she could make magic in the kitchen with very little. And what I learned from that is, creativity is born from limitations. It was also my own limitations on how I wanted my family to eat that led to one of my biggest successes at work. Because getting the daily routine and serve good and healthy meals to two athletic teenagers with very little meat was not easy. So. I started soaking, cooking and grinding legumes in the weekends that I froze into smaller bags for easy use on weekdays. And after a while, I started asking myself, why aren't there soaked, cooked and ground legumes in the store? Well, now there are. But this is really not rocket science. All I'm doing is taking the sustainable ingredients from my childhood and transforming them into sustainable food products that fits into our modern-day lifestyle. My mother always used leftovers to create new meals. So she would be shocked if she knew that around one quarter of all the calories the world produces are thrown away. They're spoiled or spilled through supply chains or wasted by retailers, restaurants and of us consumers. In fact, if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter globally, behind China and the United States. For mom, it was natural to take the leftover pancakes from Thursday's dinner and the remains of Friday's bolognese sauce to make crispy crepes on the weekend, topped with melted cheese with the very last piece of the breakfast cheese. She didn't have loads of time or money, but she had knowledge and foresight a mom would have loved the Asian-style fish cakes made from local bycatch fish and locally grown beans that our team have developed at Torsåker, despite the coriander. My mom, she thought that all kinds of food with coriander tasted like soap. <laughs> and actually, not all innovations are successful. My boss, she always asks me what version I'm on when I beg her to taste a new food product. Because after six years together, she has learned to wait until I'm in version four or five before she puts it in her mouth. A very common everyday dish during my childhood was black pudding with cabbage and lingonberry salad. Black pudding consists of blood and whole wheat rye. My mother always joked and called it suburban steak, radhus beef in Swedish. Blood is a very nutritious resource that is often discarded today, despite containing plenty of the iron that so many of us women lack. And the rye flour in the black pudding is full of fibers important for gut health that so many of us get too little of. 
And she served cabbage and lingonberry salad as a side dish because it's full of vitamin C, which helps our bodies to absorb the iron. My mother, who only completed eight years of elementary school in a small village in rural Sweden, she knew everything about minimizing waste and optimizing the nutritional value of foods. Something which has taken me over 30 years of work in the food industry to fully understand. After a few years as a journalist, I realized I could sell my knowledge to food companies. So I started an advertising agency. And what I was passionate about was helping small food producers create their brand and thus be able to make a living from their craft. But what paid the bills was hard work for some of the largest food companies, the industry giants. Seven years ago, on Midsummer's Eve, I was working in a sizzling hot studio in Stockholm with my photographer, shooting cheesecakes for one of Europe's largest dairy companies, with ambition to sell more cream cheese. I just buried my beloved mother, leaving a big hole in my heart. I was approaching 40, and I felt how much it hurt to spend so much time and creativity on food products that would hardly make the world better, rather the opposite. So there and then, I made up my mind. I went home, and I wrote a letter to the independent, non-profit, sustainability organization, Axe Foundation. And in the letter, I expressed my admiration for their work. And today, I have the privilege to work there. And after six years at Axe Foundation, one of my strongest motivators is that sustainably produced and nutritious food should not be reserved for people with money. My colleagues and I, we fight every day to raise the minimum standard. And even though radical changes are needed to transition to a sustainable food system, as time is running out, maybe we only need to go back a few decades and think, like my mother did, back to the future. And to get there, I hope that our politicians will have the courage to make the uncomfortable but life-essential decisions that are needed for a transition. I hope that grocery stores will stop advertising the most unsustainable foods, like red meat, and instead put lower margins on products like legumes, vegetables, whole grains, and locally caught underutilized fish. I hope we will stop feeding our food-producing animals with foods that we could eat ourselves. That is so brutally inefficient. I hope that we will not have such an abundance of foods that we can waste fully edible parts of animals and vegetables that do not look perfect. While we are overwhelmed with unhealthy food snacks and drinks that we don't need, but only create illness and strain the environment. I hope that red meat will become a luxury that we enjoy on special occasions and that it's sourced from animals that have been given the opportunity to graze and behave naturally. And I hope that we will have so much trust in our everyday food that we will not need all the dietary supplements that the insecurity we feel today creates a market for. I hope that food is something that we gather around and enjoy without guilt and shame. And I also hope that my children and their children will have similar magical taste memories from their childhoods, like I do. My mother died of cancer seven years ago, and I have no competence to solve that challenge. But I can, and I will, continue to carry on her sustainable way of living. And if there's one thing I want you to take with you, is that the finest thing we can give the next generation is our time at the dinner table, knowledge about how the food was produced and that it's too valuable to waste for the planet and for better global health. Thank you.